Okay, everybody, welcome to the Modern History Research Center talk uh, of today, the first one of today. And we are very lucky to have here Professor Simon Potter, who is reader in Modern History at the University of Bristol and who has been researching the history of broadcasting and particularly the BBC for many years. And today he's going to talk about his latest book, The BBC Entertaining the Nation, Speaking for Britain, 1922-2022. Obviously, the centenary that just has passed. Um, we are going to be very strict with the time. And so Professor Potter is going to give his talk. Then we're going to have a question and answer session. We are going to give a priority to the people who are in the room. And then we are going to take questions from uh, the online uh, side of things. Uh, so in the online side of things, I'm going to be asking you to either raise your hand or perhaps if the raise of hand facility doesn't work, because sometimes it happens, uh, in that case, unmute yourself and uh, give us your question in, in, in the so-called digital flesh. <laughs> so without further ado, we're going to start with the presentation, hopefully sharing here the slides. And yeah. Okay, right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for asking me for inviting me. Yes, because it might be possible. Sure. Um, so, BBC at 100. I think my subtitle is a bit pessimistic, uh, but maybe not. It's certainly felt, I think, over the last few months, the BBC has been beset by a whole series of crises. It's been a very, I think, bumpy centenary year so far for the BBC. What I want to do today is talk about some of those uh, problems that the BBC has been having, but put them in historical perspective. Think about why we have the BBC, how it's changed over the last hundred years, and whether that history provides any guide to the threats that it currently faces. Start off with a cartoon from the Radio Times from the early 1920s. It's always good to start a lecture with a cartoon of a lecture or a village wireless concert and the guy in the back asking the lady to take her hat off because he can't see the radio. It underlines the fact that at the time that the BBC was established, radio was young, it was new, it was unknown. It's gone over the last hundred years from being something that was at the cutting edge of new technologies, new ways of communicating, to something that's very familiar, and in some ways, to a world in which the term broadcasting even seems a bit outdated and old fashioned, and doesn't have the same resonance and importance perhaps to us uh, today. So there have been very, very rapid transformations over the last century. I'll try and bring some of those out over the course of my talk. So the talk is based on some of the ideas that come out of my book on the uh, BBC's last hundred years. And as I was finishing uh, the book, as I was signing off on the proofs for the book, that weekend was the weekend that the Dean Doris tweeted that it's going to be the end of the license fee and that there'll be no more license fee settlements and the current one was the last one. So I was sitting there on a Sunday as I was just about to sign up on the proofs thinking, do I have to go back to the drawing boards and rewrite the conclusions? But I didn't, largely because I couldn't face it. And I was quite happy I didn't because the next day, as you probably know, the cabinet turned around and said, no, uh, that tweet doesn't reflect government policy. Um, we didn't quite get to the bottom of why that was. I think the suspicion was that people like Rishi Sunak were worried that without the license fee, terrestrial broadcasting in Britain couldn't function. The license fee plays such a significant role in propping up so much of the British radio and television production sector and British terrestrial broadcasting that uh, without the license fee, there was no clear way of continuing to fund uh, terrestrial radio and television services. So in some ways, the sort of the old fashioned type of broadcasting is what is keeping the BBC going. It is what gives it a key raison d'etre. Without the BBC, it'd be very hard to see how uh, DAB radio, 
terrestrial digital broadcasting would carry on functioning. And uh, many, particularly older uh, members of society, still rely heavily on terrestrial broadcast services. In the medium term, though, of course, that's not a great position for the BBC to be in. It risks being the provider of legacy media, providing the sorts of media services which are increasingly outdated, being gradually abandoned by users. In turn, leaves the BBC risking uh, seeming outdated and unnecessary. The problem is, though, that if the BBC then tries to adapt and reduce its commitment to those tr traditional types of broadcasting, it attracts huge amounts of criticism. And we've seen that multiple times over the last year. Uh, cuts to local broad radio broadcasting, cuts to the World Service have attracted huge amounts of opposition, negative publicity for the BBC. So it's a very difficult position to be in. But as the BBC approaches its midterm charter review in the coming years, there are real questions about whether um, a license fee will continue, whether it will be reformed in some way, whether it's the best way to continue to fund uh, terrestrial broadcasting. Some of this uh, opposition to the license fee is clearly political in motivation, linked to various uh, commercial groups and political groups, uh, organisations like Defund the BBC, uh, pursuing a range of uh, arguments about the future of broadcasting in Britain, which are backed by different political groups and commercial groups. But also uh, reflecting the fact that the BBC is losing its audience. Um, viewing television, listening to radio is declining and declining very quickly among younger people and among people from black and Asian minority uh, ethnicity groups. So the BBC is losing its audience even during the pandemic relative to other uh, broadcast providers, program providers online, it lost its audience. So the BBC is in a very, really serious situation. Um, and the debate over the last week over impartiality feeds into that. And I'll turn to that. Um, I'll talk, I'll mention that as we go through the talk. So is this an obituary for the BBC? I hope not. Um, what I've argued in the book is the BBC is a bit like the doctor from Doctor Who, always facing old familiar enemies, Daleks and Cybermen, always regenerating in the face of seemingly mortal threats, taking on a new uh, persona and triumphing over its enemies. I'm not quite as optimistic about that perhaps now as I was six months or a year ago, um, but still I think the history of the BBC does show this constant reinvention of the organisation and constant reinvention of broadcasting. So thinking about the history of the BBC, it's probably not 13 doctors, but it's probably at least six or seven different uh, incarnations over the last hundred years. So I'll take you through some of those incarnations and think about what they tell us about the BBC over the last hundred years and perhaps the challenges the BBC faces today and its prospects for the future. So you can't have a uh, talk on the BBC without a picture of Sir John Reith, who was the first director general. He was a very tall, imposing, uh, some would say bullying man. Um, he was shot through the head in the First World War. And I think this picture minimises his scar, but I think he relished uh, his, his wound. He relished being able to show that he was uh, an officer during the First World War and in many ways carried on his military modes of command into running the early BBC. He was also an engineer by training. He wasn't a impresario. He wasn't someone from the world of literature. He was by no means an intellectual. He was a practical man who saw the role of the BBC as to provide broadcasting to the British nation in much the same, that the same way that the gas board provide you with gas or the public utilities would provide you with water. Broadcasting was something that had to be piped into every home and you could just switch it on and it provides the same 
content to everyone. He was an engineer. He viewed it as a practical technical challenge and he appointed people who thought in the same way that he did. In talking about the early BBC, I think one of the key things to take away is that there was nothing inevitable about Britain having the BBC. And in many ways, it went against all of the established traditions of the British media. So after 100 years, we sort of view the BBC as part of the furniture, maybe. But at the time, it was a very strange beast. British media traditions are based on free competition, market open market competition, the role of the marketplace, the invisible hand in guiding the expression of opinion. Uh, by 1922, 70 or 80 years of campaigning against government involvement in the media. The idea of a free press. BBC right from the outset is about controlling radio rather than promoting freedom of expression or free competition. It's a fundamentally different approach than anything in the history of the British media over the last century, really, the previous century. There are many reasons why uh, that decision is made to establish the BBC. A lot of it's to do with um, a fear among, even among the newspapers, that radio will become the sort of out of control new competitor for traditional media. So it has to be constrained, limited. There are fears that it will become uh, a fractured, unsustainable business if it's left free to commercial competition, as it had been in the United States in the early 1920s. The government, who have a job of regulating broadcasting, also argue that having a single broadcaster will make the job of regulation easier, and will make the prospects of broadcasting in Britain the most secure. So there's a whole range of reasons why this decision is made to go against British media traditions. Once that decision is made, Reith, as the first director general of the BBC, sees his job as establishing the BBC as a national institution and ensuring uh, national coverage. That is the key goal of the early BBC, making sure everyone in the country can have access to radio. What the BBC also has, which we can easily forget, is from the outset, a monopoly of all broadcasting in Britain. There are no other radio broadcasters in Britain until the 1970s. There are no other television broadcasters in Britain until the 1950s. So the BBC has a monopoly of radio until the 1970s. It has a monopoly of television between the 1930s and the 1950s. So when I say this is sort of going against British media tradition, this idea of a single monopoly broadcaster is profoundly alien to the idea of free market enterprise in the media. Reith argues that the monopoly gives the BBC the ability to deliver national coverage. Without it, British broadcasting would be fragmented. Reith also argues that with that monopoly, the BBC can go ahead and use broadcasting as a tool to promote British national unity, to promote a united British identity. And the BBC explicitly takes that role on in the 20s and 30s. It is the national broadcaster and its aim is to promote a sense of British identity and community. And uh, a lot of the work it does, for example, with monarchy, broadcasting royal occasions going right back to the 1920s is underpinned by that sense of promoting a national culture. And I think if you're looking for continuities, recent broadcast coverage of the death of Elizabeth II was a real attempt by the BBC to, to hark back and to demonstrate its continuing role. 
as promoting a sense of national unity. The other way the BBC goes about cementing its position as a national institution in this period is by promoting high culture. This idea of cultural uplift. And Reith explicitly says you know, the purpose of broadcasting is to bring the best of everything to everyone. But you don't get to pick what the best is, the BBC gets to pick. So one of the uh, notable features of the BBC right up until the mid 1930s is it has no audience research. It doesn't do audience research. There are a few minor initiatives to try and get some feedback on programmes, but there's no systematic audience research until the mid 1930s, the late 1930s, when the BBC starts to get worried that British listeners are tuning into foreign stations, particularly potentially German stations. So the BBC knows what you should have and the BBC gives you what it thinks is best. Unsurprisingly, then there's a lot of criticism of the early BBC. And I'll go on to the criticism in a second, but before moving on to that, it's also worth noting that the BBC in the 1920s is extraordinarily inventive as well. And it does some amazing things with broadcasting. So one broadcast in 1924, uh, 18 months after the BBC is founded, they send an uh, outside broadcasting team into London Zoo. They have what they call a radio pram, and they go around with this pram stuff with microphone equipment and uh, a radio transmitter, and they pick up the sounds of different animals all around London Zoo and broadcast them into people's homes. Another uh, stunt in the early 1920s is they put a comedian in an aeroplane flying over London, and he does a comic patter of what he observes flying over London, broadcast live to listeners. So the BBC does do some truly innovative and interesting stuff in this period as well. Nevertheless, the BBC is from a very early stage subject to a great deal of criticism. And unsurprisingly, at the forefront of that criticism is the Daily Mail. So if you think that the Daily Mail's hostility to the BBC is something new, it's not. It goes back at least till the mid 1930s. Partly reflects the fact that some in the newspaper industry resent the BBC's monopoly. Initially, they thought it was a good thing to protect them. But as they start to see how broadcasting is developing in America in the 30s and the potential for profit, some newspapers start lobbying for private commercial broadcasting in Britain unsuccessfully. Also, the BBC focuses on, uh, sorry, the Daily Mail and other popular newspapers focus on the BBC because it becomes a good news story. The BBC itself becomes a news story, internal conflict at the BBC, programme policies, newspapers write about it. In the 1930s, most newspapers have a radio correspondent whose job it is to write about the BBC every day. And probably the most famous of all the radio correspondents is Collie Knox of the BBC, of uh, the Daily Mail, who is a thorn in the side of the BBC throughout this period. People don't like the programmes, too much high culture, too much stuff from London. Uh, constant, uh, repeated call for more regional broadcasting, which the BBC never quite uh, buys into until well after the Second World War. And of course, the other criticism of the BBC is it's stuffed with lefties. It's too left wing. Even in the 1930s, this is what is being argued. And here's just a couple of uh, Daily Mail articles. The BBC is convinced, the Daily Mail is convinced in the early 1930s that the BBC is communist pro-Soviet Russia. And there's this campaign against the talks being broadcast on the BBC in this period, which eventually leads to the resignation of the head of the talks department. Up until the late 1920s, the BBC wasn't allowed to broadcast about politics. What was called controversial broadcasting was banned. If we think about the BBC today, politics, news, really important. Up until the late 1920s, early 30s, the BBC broadcast virtually no news because the newspapers don't want it to. They want to restrict 
competition. And the news it does broadcast is basically provided by Reuters, the news agency, as a pre-edited summary. BBC can't even edit it, just has to, the announcer just has to read it out behind the microphone. And it's not allowed to have talks about politics. What the Postmaster General, who's in charge of regulating radio at the time, says is that, quote, once you let politics into broadcasting, you'll never get politics out of broadcasting. BBC is a monopoly. How do you allow a monopoly to pass comments on the political affairs of the day? How do you make sure there's free access to the microphone, the diversity of opinion expressed, that there is no uh, corrupting or damaging influence of this monopoly on British political life? Temperatures are concerned about that in the 1920s. As they open it up in the 1930s, the BBC is embroiled from the outset in controversies over the way it covers politics. And the government directly intervenes on numerous occasions to stop people speaking on air. And it does this behind the scenes. It intervenes to stop uh, people from the British Union of Fascists speaking on air. It intervenes to stop people from uh, the British Communist Party speaking on air. This is all done behind the scenes. Uh, civil servants, government ministers going to Reef and other senior BBC officials and telling them not to do it. And the BBC obeys. Uh, similarly, foreign correspondents, particularly from Nazi Germany, British correspondents talking about Nazi Germany, are subject to foreign office scrutiny. BBC News for foreign listeners is subject to foreign office approval as well. A lot of that government intervention is kept secret. It is not officially acknowledged. How does the BBC protect itself against the criticism that this uh, approach to high culture generates the criticism of its approach to politics generates. In terms of high culture, one of the things the BBC does increasingly over the late 1930s is diversify its offering. Primarily because it's afraid that the British listeners are going to turn to continental European stations. Radio Luxembourg which sets up a high power transmitter backed by French commercial interests to beam English language programmes directly to British listeners, uh, including popular music and comedy, the sorts of programmes the BBC is not giving people enough of. That's particularly marked on a Sunday. BBC on a Sunday doesn't start till middle of the morning where you get a religious service, then you'll get sombre music, some hymns and a bit of classical music before the close down. Unsurprisingly, when Radio Luxembourg starts broadcasting nothing but pop music all through Sunday, at least a third, maybe more than a half of British listeners turn to Radio Luxembourg instead. So the BBC has to respond and it moves towards broadcasting more popular uh, programmes, more comedy, more popular music. The other way the BBC protects itself is by working even more closely with the British government. And where that is particularly marked is in the case of international broadcasting. When we think about the BBC, we probably mainly think about the programmes of the BBC producers for British audiences. But most of the time, after the Second World War, around a third of BBC employees are actually producing programmes for overseas listeners. During the Second World War, the BBC is producing more hours of programmes for foreign listeners than for British listeners. But at times, the BBC is doing more overseas than it is doing for domestic audiences. And always it has a very substantial commitment from the Second World War onwards to international broadcasting. That involvement is rooted in the BBC Empire Service, which is the first service the BBC establishes for international audiences. And it reflects the fact that the BBC 
sees itself in the 1930s as in many ways a subcontractor to the British government to provide British soft power, British cultural uh, products for listeners around the British Empire. And this is the BBC's Christmas card from 1936. And in many ways, it's a traditional Victorian image of empire. But you see all the territories of the British Empire picked out in imperial pink. It's a traditional Victorian map, but the world centers on the BBC's long range transmitter at Daventry, Northamptonshire. So this is literally an image of the world where the BBC is at its center. Uh, and there's a huge amount of fans there about the Empire Service. In many ways, and I can't go into this now, the Empire Service is quite underpowered and underperforms. But it provides a springboard for a whole host of international services. Probably the most important of which before the Second World War is the BBC Arabic service. So this is an image from a BBC uh, pamphlet from 1938 um, to accompany English language lessons for Arabic listeners. Um, and you can see the focus along the, uh, the countries around the Persian Gulf. The Arabic service is established to counter fascist Italian and German radio propaganda broadcast in the Middle East. And the roots of the Arabic service lie in very close discussions between the British government, the Foreign Office, and the BBC. And the Foreign Office ultimately retains control over the content of BBC broadcasts to uh, the Middle East during this period. It steps back gradually, granting BBC editors uh, autonomy. In the early days, though, the Foreign Office pre-vets uh, as much of the broadcast going on the Arabic service as possible. It helps create a very strong link between uh, the BBC and the Foreign Office and the British government, which then underpins the BBC's war effort and the very successful mobilization of international broadcasting during the Second World War. So in many ways, that close relationship with government that's established before the Second World War and really cemented during the Second World War is a source of strength for the BBC. But at crucial moments, it's also a source of weakness. And I'm going to skip over the Second World War. There's plenty about that in my book and in other publications. And focus on the Suez Crisis and uh, Sir Anthony Eden, the British Prime Minister during the Suez Crisis. So most of you probably know the Suez Crisis, 1956. The backstory is the uh, increasing alienation between the British and the Americans on one side and the French and the Egyptian government, culminating in the nationalization of the Suez Canal in 1956. Secret plan is made between the British, the French and the Israelis to invade Egypt to secure the canal after it's been nationalized by the Egyptians. Anthony Eden is central to that plot between the British, French and Israeli governments uh, to militarily intervene in Egypt. And when the BBC starts to reflect the diversity of opinion in Britain about this military action, this invasion, illegal invasion of Egypt, Eden becomes increasingly incensed about the BBC's editorial policies, both as it broadcasts to British listeners, but crucially as it broadcasts internationally. And Eden threatens to take the BBC, what is then the external services, under direct government control because of the fact that it is giving the oxygen of publicity to uh, Labour opponents to government policy and to the uh, diversity of British public opinion over the invasion. The man who Eden effectively delivers these threats to is a man called Sir Ian Jacob. So he is a director general of the BBC at this time. He's an unlikely figure to resist the government 
His appointment tells you something about the nature of the links between the BBC and the state in this period. During the Second World War, Jacob had been Winston Churchill's senior military advisor. And he's brought into the BBC external services after the war to be a liaison effectively between the Foreign Office and the BBC. And he rises to become Director General of the BBC. So Eden delivers his threat, follow the government line, or the external services will be taken under direct state control. Jacob refuses. And for a while, it looks as if the uh, government grant to the external services might be withdrawn. Direct, a direct advisor, government advisor is put into uh, Bush House. And it looks like a direct state takeover of the external services might happen. But as you probably know, the Suez crisis turns out to be a total disaster for the British government. Uh, there's a run on sterling and the price the Americans charge for bailing the British out is to insist on a complete ceasefire. Eden has a nervous breakdown effectively, goes off to the Caribbean to stay on Ian Fleming's estate to recuperate. His prime ministership is over. And in some ways, the BBC weathers that storm. But it shows the vulnerabilities that the BBC faces because of the extent of, it linked, of its links with the British state this period. Perhaps then the next most significant challenge to uh, the BBC before the Thatcher years is the establishment of commercial television. 1954, the BBC loses its monopoly over British broadcasting, at least when it comes to television. And Jacob is also the director general who has to deal with this loss of the BBC's monopoly. Many uh, suspect that it reflects the hostility of Eden's predecessor as Prime Minister to the BBC, Winston Churchill, who's never a big fan of the BBC. Under Jacob, the BBC's policy is of very restrained competition with the new commercial broadcaster, ITV. So from 1954, there's just one competitor to the BBC, ITV. And Jacob says, well, we'll continue to do what we do best, provide uplifting programmes, high culture, programmes for the elite. And we'll be satisfied with an audience of perhaps a third of the BBC television viewing public. That's pretty disastrous. Because as more and more people switch off their radios and turn to television, BBC starts to dwindle into insignificance. And by the time that Jacob's term as Director General comes to the end in 1960, the BBC is facing real challenges because people suspect that if it's only catering to a small minority of the public, the license fee can no longer be justified. So Eden's successor, it's not Eden, sorry, uh, Jacob's successor as Director General is Hugh Carlton Green. Uh, the Cheltenham Festival is probably quite an apposite cartoon again. Um, this is uh, Carlton Green going into the big discussion of the future of the BBC and its competition with commercial broadcasting. Uh, Hugh Carlton Green was the brother of Graham Green, the author. Um, he was a gift to cartoonists because he was very tall, but also quite large and had very large heads. So people drew these cartoons of him that people thought were actually quite accurate. Um, so Green, again, seems to be an unlikely choice of a non-establishment figure. Green wakes his way up through the BBC as a Cold War warrior. He starts off uh, as running the BBC's, uh, he's running the BBC's German service during the Second World War, conducting anti-Nazi anti broadcasting. He then goes on to uh, set up broadcasting in occupied Germany in the British sector, the British zone of occupied Germany. He runs propaganda broadcasting to East Germany. Uh, he gets seconded to the colonial office to run the counterinsurgency radio operations in Malaya 
during the Malayan emergency. Uh, he's a propagandist. He's a Cold War warrior. He's got very close links with uh, British civil servants. But he realizes that the BBC can't go on serving a minority. It has to appeal to a majority audience. And under his director generalship, it goes for much more popular programming, much more provocative program, programming, much more controversial programming. So some of the things that Hugh Carlton Green oversees is the introduction of political satire to the BBC. The famous program, that was the week that was, the first television satire in Britain. He oversees the introduction of hard hitting, uh, social realistic drama, documentaries on topics like teenage pregnancy, homelessness. Uh, he effectively overhauls the BBC's offering. And the BBC once again starts to attract the majority of the British viewing public. But again, it comes at a cost. One of the big questions that the BBC faces by the end of Hugh Carton's Green's director generalship in the late 1960s is if the BBC is providing lots of popular programming for a mass audience, why do we need the licence fee to fund that? Why, do, why does the BBC need this public money to produce popular programming, which commercial television is quite happy and able to do as well? Green narrows the difference between the BBC and commercial competitors and leads people to question, do we actually need a public broadcaster? He also angers uh, the government, Harold Wilson's government, um, uh, with, again, supposedly uh, the political bias of his programming. Uh, Wilson thinks the BBC is anti-Labour. And uh, Wilson, in the end, puts a BBC chairman into place who is uh, the former head of commercial television in Britain, Lord Hill of Luton. And David Attenborough, who was, I think, the controller of BBC Two at the time, was said to have said that it was like um, putting Rommel in charge of the Fifth Army. It was basically like handing BBC over to its arch enemy. And Green resigns shortly after this happens. So political intervention, politically motivated appointments of chairman, there's nothing new about that. That idea of prime ministers using their ability to appoint the chairman of the BBC, which of course has been in the news over the last few weeks, the fact that the BBC chairman is still a direct political appointment by the, well, supposedly non-political appointment, but appointed directly by the Prime Minister. Thatcher famously used this to try and bring the BBC to heel in the 1980s. Margaret Thatcher thought the BBC was against the government's policy in the Falklands War, was against government's policy in the miners' strike, was against government policy in Northern Ireland, and thought that the BBC's editorial line wasn't neutral. Because if it was neutral, of course, it'd be in favour of Margaret Thatcher. So Thatcher goes about appointing people to key positions who will be her supporters. The uh, chairman, she um, appoints, first of all, dies quite young and is replaced by a man called Marmaduke Hussey, who is a core Thatcher loyalist. And he, she also brings in as Hussey's deputy, Chairman William Rees Mogg, who's the father of Jacob Rees Mogg. Hussey and Rees Mogg come in and they start a campaign to get rid of the BBC's Director General, a man called uh, uh, Alastair Milne, who's the father of Seamus Milne, the, the left wing uh, correspondent and political advisor. So together, Rees Mogg and Hussey drive out the BBC's Director General and bring in, ultimately, after an interim, uh, Director General, a man called John Burt. John Burt, described as the most hated man in British broadcasting. Uh, I've read his memoirs, so you don't have to. I think it 
it probably tells you something about it's the only book I've ever seen where somebody put five pictures of themselves on the cover <laughs> of their book. Um, and it does give you a good sense of what's in the book as well. Um, Bert goes about fundamentally restructuring the BBC to introduce internal market. Imposes strong editorial control over BBC News to ensure that there's impartiality in BBC News coverage. And he starts to introduce uh, internal markets, the buying in of content from outside the BBC, the slimming down of BBC's staff to basically uh, reflect the free market policies of the 1980s and to show the British government that the BBC is fit to continue into the future. Bert is successful in this, in that he does ensure the continued existence of the BBC in the face of government hostility. And he keeps the BBC popular. His successor, Greg Dyke, um, tries to bring in a very different sort of BBC, much less uh, driven by um, the corporate management speak of, of Bert, but Dyke does nothing to reverse the ideas about internal markets, commercialization, making revenue from sources other than the license fee to keep the BBC going. So this period sees the BBC increasingly commercialized, increasingly generating revenue out of uh, uh, spin-off companies, wholly owned private subsidiaries. The nature of public broadcasting in Britain changes, and I'll talk about that again in a minute. But where Dyke comes a cropper is over the Iraq war. So BBC again covers criticism of the policy of Tony Blair, criticism of the war in Iraq, and also criticism of the evidence that the British government has used to justify military intervention, the dodgy dossier, weapons of mass destruction. And famously, I can't go into the details now, but um, Andrew Gilligan's reports on the evidence that the government used, drawing on uh, an insider informer who subsequently commits suicide, attracts extreme opposition from Alastair Campbell, uh, a campaign arguably waged against the BBC for its coverage of the government's use of evidence, ultimately culminating in the forcing out of Greg Dyke as Director General. Direct political intervention, arguably, in the BBC. All of these debates over the relationship between the government and the BBC, effectively, that we are seeing today, have these historical precedents, attempts to reform the structures of governance of the BBC uh, to try and reduce the ability of the government to influence the BBC's management have all failed. So these challenges that the BBC faces today, they're, they're manifold, and they do have historical precedent. I think you can turn to uh, the last hundreds of years of the BBC, of its history, to help understand them. The issue of, of impartiality, which has been in the headlines over the last week, has been uh, a debate that has run across the BBC, BBC's history, going right back to the late 1920s. A lot of our ideas about the role the BBC is meant to play, arguably in politics, arguably can be rooted back to this period when the BBC is a monopoly. And arguments about the BBC's legitimate role in politics date back to those years. Also a period when the BBC 
remains a dominant voice in the British media. During the, the 1960s, 1970s, there is an attempt to argue that the BBC's engagement with politics is legitimate because it can give voice to a wide diversity of political viewpoints and opinions. And the argument is that individual programmes or news items might have a political bias, but across the whole BBC output, there is equality, there is balance, there is impartiality. I think what we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years is a refusal to accept that. But many people now will not be prepared to accept that you judge the BBC's output across the whole breadth and think about political uh, impartiality in those terms. People want to judge the BBC on individual news items. And I think the BBC is in an impossible situation if that is the judge, the, the way we judge impartiality. It's not possible for the BBC to be impartial on every single news item. I think the BBC does have an exit strategy um, in terms of how it will operate in the future. As public broadcasting funded by the license fee as a public corporation seems increasingly untenable in the face of so much political and commercial opposition. And the thing that really surprised me as I was doing the research for the book, the last chapter, was the history of BBC's commercial operations. Ever since the 1970s, 1980s, more and more of what the BBC does is housed in wholly owned commercial subsidiaries. Until today, there's something called BBC Studios. BBC Studios, I'm not sure if people have noticed its existence or noted the existence you might see at the end of a television programme on the credits. Basically, all of the BBC's television production facilities, apart from in news and sports, are now run by a private commercial company, wholly owned by the BBC, operated on commercial lines. And BBC Studios doesn't just make programmes for the BBC, makes programmes for Netflix, it makes programmes for Prime. If the licence fee ceases to exist, if the public corporation ceases to exist, I think BBC Studios is how the BBC has created a future for itself. Perhaps a future beyond terrestrial broadcasting as well. But I think the other continuity and the other way the BBC is seeking to uh, secure its continuity is by continuing to maintain a relationship with the government as a subcontractor for British cultural diplomacy, soft power or propaganda. During the early stages of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Boris Johnson's government gave the BBC millions of pounds to start broadcasting on shortwave to Ukraine and Russia, news services on old fashioned shortwave radio seems almost incomprehensible that Boris Johnson's government would give the BBC more money, but it did. And it was because it was the only way that British news could reach Ukraine and Russia, it was felt, circumventing damage to Ukrainian uh, internet infrastructure, circumventing Russian restrictions on uh, news coming in and out of the country. And it was announced, uh, I think yesterday, that the BBC is also going to receive another 20 million pounds of state money over the next two years to support the World Service. One of the other reasons why the government has stayed its hand on the licence fee is because it's very unclear how we would support not just a whole range of domestic British services, but Britain's international broadcasting without the BBC. And I think the BBC recognises that, and it's one of the reasons why it's continued to act as this powerful voice of Britain in the wider world. So I think that's from BBC Studios, a part of BBC's future. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Brilliant. My goodness, you left up with uh, lots of things to think about. Right. So let's let's just stop the presentation mode here, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah.